Christine and Leia Papian were born in France in the early 1900s. Christine in 1905 and Leia in 1911. They had a very troubled childhood. Their father Gustav was an abusive alcoholic and the mother was considered to be of low morals and unsuited for motherhood. Clements gave birth to her first child, Emilia, in 1901. Four years later, when Christine came into the world, Clements decided it was all too much for her and gave the baby into the care of Gustav's sister. Shortly after Leah was born, Clements discovered that her husband had raped the oldest daughter, Emilia, who was 10 at the time. Clements immediately filed for divorce and Emilia was packed off to a convent. Clements believed that Amelia had seduced her father and as punishment sent her to be raised by nuns at the convent of Le Bon Pasteur that was known for its discipline and harshness. As further revenge against the children, she sent Christine away from the loving home of her aunt to join her sister at the convent. To further release herself from the responsibility of motherhood, she sent the youngest, Leah, to live with a great uncle. Clemence's punishment backfired. The girls must have flourished in their new stable environment, away from drunken violence and abuse. Not only did the sisters grow very close to each other, but as soon as Amelia was old enough, she took the vows and became a nun. Christine intended to follow in her beloved sister's footsteps as soon as she was eligible. Clemence was livid with rage when she heard the news of Amelia's decision to join the order. She had planned for them to leave the convent as soon as they were old enough to work and to seek employment as live-in maids. Clements removed Christine immediately, fearing losing another potential income and found her work in the middle-class households of Le Mans. Because she had been trained in a variety of domestic duties in the convent, she fitted into this life with ease. Her employers were very satisfied with her, but her mother was not satisfied with the wages they paid her daughter, and so forced Christine to resign from numerous positions and seek better paid ones. Leah was removed from her uncle's care and also pushed out to work as a maid. Despite the youngest and middle sisters being separated so long, they discovered a bond and enjoyed each other's company immensely, seeking each other out in their free time. In 1926, Christine obtained the position as maid and cook in the home of a retired lawyer, Monsieur Lancelin and his family, which consisted of his wife, Leonie, and two grown daughters. One daughter was married and lived away. The other, Genevieve, was still at home. After a few months of most satisfactory service, Christine convinced Madame Lancelin to take on Leah as chambermaid. The two girls rarely went out, except to church on Sundays, and to visit a local fortune teller regularly, who told them that they had been together as man and wife in a previous incarnation. They worked long hours, and the Lancelins were very pleased to have such hard-working and pious girls under their roof, who showed no interest in finding suitors or going dancing in their free time. The Lancelins couldn't believe their luck.
Although the Lancelins found their new servants perfect in every way, a previous employer had stated that Christine was extremely imperious and would get agitated if told to perform a duty she felt beneath her. This particular lady sacked Christine after just 15 days. Local shopkeepers also found the girls to be very peculiar in their manner and said their personalities were cold and distant. All that aside, the sisters got on well with Madame Lancelin and her daughter. They were well fed, given a heated room and paid the standard wages for the time. Christine and Leia even began to look upon Madame Lancelin as a mother figure, addressing her as Maman, while referring to their own mother as that woman. When Madame Lancelin became aware that the sisters had been sending all of their wages to their mother, she took matters in hand and urged the girls to keep the money for themselves, and took it upon herself to let Mademoiselle Papin know that her gravy train had finally stopped. The sisters even had a small balcony on which they could watch the people of Le Mans going about their daily business, quite a luxury for servants at the time. All was well for a few years. As time went by though, the lady of the house started scrutinizing the cleaning and became very critical of it leading even to physical assault as Madame Lancelin pinched Leia very hard and kept doing so while forcing her to kneel on the floor to retrieve a small scrap of paper she had missed while sweeping up. Later on in the evening, when the girls were in their room, Leia confided to Christine that should the Madame try such a thing again, she would be ready to defend herself next time. On February the 2nd, 1933, Madame Lancelin and her daughter went out for the day, while Monsieur Lancelin went off to his offices as usual. Leia later claimed the reason that the house was in darkness upon their employer's return was because she had shorted the power when she plugged in a faulty iron. Sometime in the early evening, the Lancelin ladies returned home from their shopping expedition. When the two Lancelin ladies reached home, they were met at the door by Christine, who explained the reason for the house being in darkness. According to Christine, Madame Lancelin flew into a fiery rage upon hearing this. Christine picked up a pewter jug and smashed the Madame over the head with it. Genevieve then joined the fray to assist her mother, whereupon Leia leapt in to help her sister. Christine shouted to her sister, I'm going to massacre them. Christine gave the orders and directed Leia to smash her head into the ground, pointing to the older woman. She also told Leia to tear her eyes out. These atrocities were also inflicted upon Genevieve. Now, with their victims lying dazed and helpless, and without their sight, the Papin sisters collected a few weapons to finish off their employers. Using a knife and hammer, they beat and stabbed the Lancelin women without mercy. They said afterwards the women were screaming and moaning and calling out, but the Papin girls couldn't hear what they were saying, or more likely, they weren't listening. After judging the victims to be deceased, they prepared the corpses as if for cooking. Indeed, Christine described it as following the recipe for a rabbit dish from a 1901 cookbook. Not quite done with this outrage, they lifted the victim's skirts over their bloody pulped heads and mutilated their bottoms and thighs. As if applying a baste, the sisters used the menstruation blood of Genevieve and smeared this all over the Lancelin ladies. Satisfied with their work, 
the girls calmly tidied up after themselves and then began their evening toilet in readiness for retiring to bed. Monsieur Lancelin returned home to find the house tightly locked. Assuming his wife and daughter had already left for the dinner engagement they were all invited to later on that evening, he continued on to this destination and was dismayed to find they had not arrived. Now, uneasy, he returned with a friend who was at the dinner party. They noticed that the only light was flickering candlelight emitted from the servant's room on the top floor. Now, thoroughly alarmed, they summoned a gendarme, who gained entry by scaling the rear garden wall. Nothing had prepared them for the grisly sight that greeted them as they entered the dwelling. As the officer shone his flashlight over the stairwell leading to the crime scene, he shuddered as the light revealed a milky eyeball staring back at him. At this point, the gendarme ordered Monsieur Lancelin and his colleague to stay downstairs. On the second floor, he discovered the carnage that the Papian girls had caused. The facial features of the two women were unrecognizable. Madame Lancelin's ripped-out eyeballs were found draped around her neck in the folds of her scarf. Fearing the two servants had met a similar fate, he continued up to the third floor. A glowing keyhole directed him to their room. Hearing hushed voices within, he tried the door but found it locked. After knocking and still getting no answer, he broke the lock mechanism and forced his way in. On the bed in the corner of the room lay the two culprits in a tight embrace, shivering in fear. Next to them on a small table lay a blood and brain matter encrusted hammer. The sisters immediately confessed to the killings, but claimed self-defense. They were arrested and charged with murder. Amazingly, there was a lot of public sympathy for the two young women, not only amongst the populace in general, but also from the intellectual giants of the day, including Jean-Paul Sartre, Simone de Beauvoir, and Jean Genet, who believed it to be a sign of class struggles between the rich and the very poor. Their appointed lawyer pleaded insanity on their behalf. Christine and Leia certainly looked the part, making no eye contact and staring straight ahead as if in a daze. They protected each other and wouldn't implicate one another. Both confessed sole responsibility for the crime. Their lawyer cited their terrible upbringing and told of a cousin who had died in an insane asylum. Also their grandfather who was prone to violent fits of rage, plus an uncle who had committed suicide as evidence of hereditary disposition towards insanity. However, three medical experts for the prosecution swayed the jury by stating that they had examined the Papian sisters and found them to be sane but totally cold-blooded and calculating detailing how they had meticulously cleaned up after the carnage. Surprisingly, the bizarre mutilations and preparation of the corpses for cooking were not elaborated upon. 
This certainly didn't appear to be the actions of anyone of a sane mind, but the court and jury had already decided on the verdict. The sentence was handed down. The court showed compassion for Leia, who they believed was under the power of her older sister. She was given 10 years hard labor. Christine was sentenced to death by guillotine, which was to take place on the 30th of September 1933 in the public square at Le Mans. During their confinement, the sisters were kept separated. Christine's mental health deteriorated rapidly because of this and she repeatedly begged to see Leia. She had violent fits, refused to eat and attempted to tear her own eyes out, after which she was placed in a straitjacket. Finally, the warden relented and allowed the sisters to see each other. During this visit, Christine made sexual advances to Leia, attempting to unbutton her blouse and repeating, Say yes, please. On January the 22nd, 1934, President Albert Lebrun issued a stay of execution for Christine. She was resentenced and given a term of hard labor for life, but was transferred after only a few years to an insane asylum in Rennes. She had written a letter pleading to be with Leia. This wish was not granted. She then refused to eat and wasted quickly away dying there at the age of 32 on the 18th of May 1937. Leia was released from prison on grounds of good behaviour after she had served eight years and was free in 1941. She went to live with her mother in Nantes and got a job as a hotel maid under an assumed name. There is no exact date when she died, but there was a photo taken of her as an elderly lady. It is now believed the girl suffered from a condition known as folie à deux, literally madness in pairs, also known as shared paranoid disorder. Characteristically, this condition occurs in small groups or pairs who become isolated from society and lead an intense inward-looking existence with a paranoid view of the outside world. Most couples who commit murders together, in fact, have this kind of insular, very obsessive and inward-looking relationship. It is also typical of shared paranoid disorder that one partner dominates the other, and the Papian sisters were the perfect example. They are buried in the Cimetière La Bottellerie in Nantes. Hello there once again my friends. Uh, first of all I would uh, just like to apologize to my French viewers and I know I have some because they have given me some lovely feedback. I would like to apologize for my humorous attempts at trying to pronounce some of these French words and phrases but I can assure you I did my best. So I hope you can overlook uh, my massacre of your beautiful language. <laughs> Uh, I would just like to address another point. Uh, some viewers have asked me saying uh, they would like more pictures on my historical videos and some viewers have asked 
you know, am I using authentic images for the story? To address the first point, I always try to look for period images, either photos or paintings that relate to the story, and it's very difficult. You, you, you've got more chance of finding modern images, but I don't want to use them. I really want to use authentic old vintage images. So, and it's, as I say, it's very hard to find them. That's why I don't have that many of them. So I thank you for your understanding on that. Uh, addressing the second point, some of these stories um, are really quite old and it's very difficult to find any factual images that relate to them. So I have to use artistic license and find anything that I will think that matches the story and, and I use that. That's, that's all I can do. If there are any factual images, rest assured, I will use them. So I thank you for your understanding on, on that subject. And now I would like to give a shout out to a viewer who has uh, pointed out a video that she has uploaded uh, of her with one of my obsolete oddity mugs, coffee mugs or tea mugs, whatever you want to put in it. So I would like to give her a big shout out and I'm going to show you the video right now of her with the mug. Um, please head over to her page, give her a thumbs up and give her some words of encouragement. That's what we want to do on YouTube. We want to encourage and anyone that's creating out there, give them all the help possible as you guys do to me. And I really appreciate it and I know she will. So thank you, Madeline, for that. And any of you guys out there who, who have bought my products and you'd like to see your face on one of my videos then please yeah send me a video of yourself wearing or drinking from one of my products and I'll be yeah most pleased to to include it in one of my videos so thank you for your support with that and the, the next two videos will be uh, re-edits of old silent historical features with narration so yeah, they'll come a bit quicker than the time that it's taken me to make this video. This was quite a long one, quite a bit of work, but the re-editing doesn't take as long, so they'll be coming uh, quicker than this one. So thanks for your patience and thanks for watching. See you next time, my friends.